it's another episode of Donnie's Disposals. I am your host, Coach Donnie Hess here, and today we have another AFL review. And joining me as my co-host this round, the awesome, fantastic, and always fun to chat with footy commentator for the USAFL and media manager for the USAFL, Mr. Brian Barish. Brian, thank you for joining me, sir. Uh, always good, good day, Donnie. Always to be, always great to be, and, and and eventually I'll find my words. So by the time we get started, <laughs> I'll actually know how to do. It. But it's great to be here with you. A pretty eventful round, eh? Definitely, and the fact that you have Sir Douglas Nichols round ha- having so much happen during it, and those fantastic jerseys, legitimately always a fantastic. I love the Sir D- Douglas Nichols two rounds. I love that they've went to two rounds, being able for both home and away teams to be able to have that chance to rock those fantastic Guernseys. We will talk some more about that in just a little bit, but before we bounce through each of the games individually and discuss the nuttiness that was this round real quick just a quick wrap up thoughts on round 10 because as you said a a very interesting and exciting round of football oh it was was incredible i mean it had it had everything it had uh it had close games it had historic blowouts it had the uh the second uh largest blowout by a last place team we had a game that was decided on a technicality we had a <laughs> we had a coach we had a coach just just throw his hands up and take his ball and go home midway through it uh, and all the controversy surround that with a with a leak um you know it's not quite the adelaide leak but you know um but you know it, it's a. Uh, it was, I mean, it was, there was a lot, but I think uh, things are starting to take shape a little bit and uh, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, you know, especially with the top six really kind of starting to separate from the rest of the field. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but yeah, this was a very eventful week. And I think it probably one of the most eventful weeks that, that at this juncture of the season, we're, you know, not even to the halfway point yet. Mm-hmm. And, and we've had a week like this. Yeah, it was, it was an incredible round, and it started off great, so let's jump into it. First game of the round sees a little bit of a shocker for some as the Port Adelaide Power at home take down the mighty, mighty Nam Demons, and I'm not even going to make an attempt at Port Adelaide, so any Port Adelaide fans, it, it, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to use Port Adelaide because I'm not sure if I don't want to butcher their partic- the particular indigenous name there, but a fantastic four-point win by the Power, 80-76. to 76. Oh my gosh, Zach Butters, have a day out, sir. How fantastic was this game to see Port Adelaide get the Chalkies over the, the favored Ds? That's a Yarda Politi. Uh, Yara Pulte, sorry, Yara Pulte, Yara Pulte is the, yep. Yara Pulte, um, <laughs> is the is the name that they went by this week. Um I, I, it's it's amazing, especially when you look at the fourth quarter and you see that they outscored the power forty four to nineteen in that third quarter, and they kicked seven goals. And you thought to yourself, "Oh, they're going to win this game on a canter." Uh, but I mean, I, it, it's amazing to me how how Melbourne in some of these games they look as 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 strong as they are, and you think to yourself, "Man, this is this is this perennial team and, and all the players that they have." Uh, that they're that you know they're just going to win this game in a cruise control and then all of a sudden here come the power who came back in that fourth quarter and they they kicked uh, they kicked three goals six in that fourth quarter I mean they looked completely in control just about Um, and they got their spread of goal kickers of course butters being butters he kicked two goals and had 41 touches and 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 that was part of the difference Um, you know the power the 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 power I think are a lot better than than really a lot a lot of people think they are and especially when in when you win games like this I mean it's a home game so it's not like if if they would have won at the MCG I think it would have been even more impressive but this was still you know pretty impressive in its own right and and for them to come away with as you said for them to come away with the four points and really kind of put the pressure on the top of the table i think really might help define define their season in such a in such a great top four matchup yeah, it was fantastic. And, and and the fact that Port Adelaide did this without Charlie Dixon, without yeah. Todd Marshall, is even more impressive. And, and it makes you kind of question Melbourne a little bit because this is the second time this season where a game that you would expect them to win, 
they fall just a little bit short, like like the Essendon game earlier in the season. So I'm fascinated to see how this goes. Unfortunately, if I saw it correctly, Clayton Oliver may be out anywhere yeah. between a month, which I don't think is as big a hit to Melbourne as say a Maxi Gone or a Steven May would have been. But it's gonna it's gonna hit that midfield a little bit when it's it's gonna test their depth a little bit. I think Angus Brayshaw may see himself in the square a little bit more. Um, so it'd be fascinating to see how it goes. I think Melbourne will be okay, but this one this one got away from them a little bit. And Port Adelaide, Kenny Hinckley right now is just smiling all as all get out because right now he is making sure that all the pressure is going to be on the club to re-sign him in August when they decide to sit down and have discussions because he is looking like an absolute genius right now, which always makes me chuckle when a coach can can get on a run like this because he can almost guarantee himself a, a contract extension as long as he can keep this up. And looking at their run, I think there's a really good shot he could hit August looking cherry, cherry ripe. So as you kind of stated in your thoughts, the next game is the game that everybody is talking about because of how it ended as Sydney get the win 93 90. But as you said, on a technicality due to an interchange infringement as North Melbourne goes over the 75 with a 76th rotation, which at the time it was finally f- discovered led to a free kick and a 50 meter penalty from inside the 50 thus making it a guaranteed goal kick which then gave the swans the win but I, i'm gonna sit here and say it yes the swans won on a technicality but they had to be there to have that opportunity mm-hmm. and they really did fight back but i i will i will be honest as a swan supporter North Melbourne lost this more than the Swans won this. North Melbourne played fantastic footy, seeing Wardlow, Sheasel, and, and, and some of these youngsters that, that North has been able to acquire really have a day out against a experienced team, an experienced midfield like Warner Robottom and, and Parker, who were in the grand final last year. There's got to take a little bit of confidence. Yes, it's got to be devastating that they lost that game, but they've got to take a lot of confidence because they played really, really well in this game. I mean, they. I mean, honestly, they hung with them the entire time, and and you know, I mean, you look at you look at where the two teams are right now. I mean, in North, I mean, the the joke is is when you list the ladder, it's like it could be just about any possible way. The mm-hmm. way the game's gone, North Melbourne at the bottom, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I. I it's and, and here's the other thing because we'll, we'll talk I think about what happened with the rule um, you know because there's a lot of people that are saying oh this is just another example of just the AFL adding an unnecessary rule and an unnecessary I mean it's been what 10 years since it's been in the league mm-hmm. and I don't recall and, and perhaps Donnie you can correct me but I don't ever recall ever seeing that called Um you know, I mean, not, I'm not saying it, it it hasn't been called, but I don't know that that's ever happened. I, as far as I, I looked on social media and I know somebody who's been watching the game for like 30, 40 years. And I, as you said, this the, the new um, limit to rotations has is a relatively new thing because it used to be unlimited rotations or there for a while. It was rotations like soccer, where if you come off, you're off. Yeah. for the rest of the game. So the, the game has changed a lot. But as far as I am aware, this is the first time that this has ever been called because this is the first time anybody's actually went over. Most of, I remember la- I, it was either last year or two years ago, there was a game between Sydney and Essendon and Essendon with four minutes left hit 75. So yeah. they couldn't rotate anymore. Yeah. And because that was, I remember the broadcast even saying, well, if there's a concussion, if there's a concussion and a guy comes off, can they bring somebody on? And, there was a lot of I'm not sure is that would that be it would would they would they risk the the infraction for it and they never really said what and I know there I had I had a couple of friends of mine who who had tweeted said I didn't know what would happen if somebody did this now I know and it was like it was almost cruel as they asked that because you find out but it it is one of those where I look at it and I go it was just it was just a, a freak situation that yeah. happened to happen that I don't Shields did not know that they were one away. So when he came off with cramp, he didn't think there was a problem. And then when Powell comes off, it, it just happened. I mean, I felt horrible for the stu I felt horrible for the interchange steward because there's nothing much he can do. Two players ran off, two players ran on. He's like, oh, oh no. 
So <laughs> yeah, and and the other thing, and the other thing though, you, you do have to remember is is because there was a lot of people just kind of questioning the circumstances and say and say, oh well, you know, because here's here's the thing, Donnie. If the ball, if this is called with the ball 180 meters in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. we're probably not, I mean, we're probably not talking about this as much as it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the rule is, and honestly, it's the same, I think it's the same thing with a count. You can't just stop the game as the play is going on. You have to bring the attention of the officials, and it does very bring much depend on play. where the ball is. Exactly. And and that's and that's what it is. So it's perhaps bad luck and bad juju that 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 this was called and that this was adjudicated with the ball inside North Melbourne's defensive fifty because essentially they they handed them the game. Now overall. I think you're absolutely right. I think they I think they actually deserve to win this game because they hung with Sydney, who is a much better team. I mean, Sydney has a better chance of making the finals than North Melbourne does. They hung with them for the entire for the entire game. And some of those guys, you know, like Bailey and I'm sorry, like Scott Rather and Simpson, they and Cheezel, they had a they had a, a pretty solid effort. Unfortunately, you need in a game like that, you cannot make a big mistake down the line. And 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 listen, it's it's one game, it sucks, um, you know. And and at this point, you know the way that the that the that that North is, and they've been, and they're they're going to need to kind of they're going to need to move past this. There's still you know all this time left in the season. There's still 13 games left in the season, so they have to put this behind us as quickly as possible and and move forward. And just taking a look and seeing you know, who, who they've, who they've got next week, uh, you know, they host Collingwood, so they don't have any time to mope over this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely for sure. It's one of those, and we'll discuss it a little bit more because, and we kind of already kind of went through it a little bit. We can kind of rehash it a little bit, but I just, I remember talking with some of my, and, and I, in fact, I recently just did a podcast and I said, I, in, in all honesty, I'm I'm a diehard Swans fan, but I, I'll admit North should have won that game. It, it's just it, it's just a, a cruel circumstance that happened at the time. Was this a travesty that the that the that the AFL did this? No, it's a rule that's on the rule book. And as you said, if if this was done and if this would have been discovered in the back fifty, if the Swans would have been holding on for dear life and got this fifty to where they were kicking out, it made the game may not have changed. It's just it, it's just a cruel situation where the fifty the the free kick in the fifty was discovered while they were in their forward fifty. That's just the way it happens. It's cruel. It's a kind of a sucky way to lose the game for North, but it's the situation that happened. So yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want to harp on this too much just because I think it's very, it's, this is kind of a black and white situation uh, and we can discuss a little bit, a little bit later. So we'll jump on to the, the Duggies V Crows up in Ballarat as the Duggies put a smashing on their Crows, which I, I didn't see this coming at 85 to 40 win, a 45 point win by the Duggies. But honestly, Brian, looking at this score worm, if I'm the Crows, I'm thinking all get out that the Duggies were inaccurate because that's the reason this game could have been much, much a worse loss than it was. Oh, yeah, 40, 45 points. And and just looking at the scores, it, it it's interesting if you look at the if if you just in the second quarter and the fourth quarter. The two teams tied. Uh, what is that? Twenty four, twenty four. Just in those two quarters, and and that's that's the difference is that in the first quarter the Bulldogs outscored the Crows thirty one to eight and thirty to eight. But again, by the same token, they kicked. They had thirty scoring shots and they only connected on eleven. If you throw ten of them the other, you know, ten of those scoring shots the other way. You know, we're looking at a at a much heavier defeat, and in a situation where the Crows are right in that logjam for the last two final spots, percentage is going to be very important. So you're absolutely right, thanking their thanking their lucky stars, and um, you know, you're looking at at some of these guys like Libertori and, and Waitman and and uh, you know Bailey Williams. You know, them kicking them them missing crucial crucial shots um and then as far as adelaide is concerned you know 
a lot of those guys really didn't, other than Rory Laird, a lot of those guys really didn't step up. So absolutely, you know, I, and especially it's always tough to play in Ballarat. It's always a little bit colder. It's always a little bit, you know, it's always um, just, just the atmosphere is different. It's, it's you know, honestly, you know, it, it's essentially a Western Bulldogs, like a true home game in the same, mm-hmm. the same way that like a, you know, a cat, the cats have uh, Cardinia park. It, it, it is it is very very difficult to play there and so yeah i mean it could have been much 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 worse for the crows yeah it, 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 they they did rest a few players i know tex walker didn't play in there and i think riley phil phil, phil Thorpe didn't play either so I, you had a little bit of the front targets i mean darcy fogarty is, is a great player but i think sometimes he meshes well with tex walker and not having him there might have thrown that off a little bit going forward but again dougie's just so good out of the midfield again bontempelli liberatore they're they're plethora of options the thing that really stunk was the fact that jason johannesson went down with an injury in this game so we'll have to see how does bevel kind of react to that change because johannesson has kind of had a renaissance this season out of the halfback lines we'll have to see how it goes but doggy's just too good on the day for sure so we come out to another one of the upsets of this round as I'm again, Fremantle fans. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make the attempt. If I butcher this, I do apologize. Wally, Wally Yip, Yup, Wally Yup. I I again, if I'm completely missed this, I do apologize. While 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 y'all up, while y'all up, take down the 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 Geelong Cats at home, 106 77. Oh my gosh, the Dockers kick a hundred points. They're starting to find their mojo now a little bit. The Dockers are starting to kind of find that form that they were desperately missing earlier in the season. They're always fun to watch. They've always been fun to watch. I mean, even even in the days of you know Ballantyne and and uh, <laughs> and and you know Mike, Michael Walters when he first came into the league and all of these guys, and even going back to their to the days when they were just like, haha, you know, they're the teams with the funny jumpers and they always come in last. And mm-hmm. no, they're always they're they're always exciting. And through through Amos and, and Walters again, who each kicked three in this game, um, you know, I mean. It was fun. They took they took that initial shot from the you know they hung with the with the cats I and mean, the cats, as as they always do. I mean, it seems like you know they they generally seem to be kept pretty low. You know, they didn't have any real standout players for them statistically. Tui and Brune each had nineteen disposals, and that was it. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the last time I saw a team. You know, I mean, it's not like they had a bad game. They scored seventy-seven points. So I, mm-hmm. it's 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 been a long time since I've seen nobody break the twenty touch mark, and that just kind of shows you how how well and how good they are defensively. And then they finally were able to, as you said, they were finally able to put triple digits up. Um, so I think it's a, I mean, it's a it's a good solid win for them. And and they're in again. They're in with those other three teams with twenty points right now, and for Geelong. You know, they're 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 with there as well. I think this this hurts them. I mean, obviously it does, but um, you know they've had some bigger wins earlier in the season, and that's what's kind of keeping them sort of at the top of that mini heat. But I mean, it's a huge win, uh, and and if they do end up making the finals, they can they can look back at this one and say, yeah, this is this is this is one of uh, you know very pivotal in in the success. Yeah, definitely for sure. I think the cats are starting to kind of their, their injury list is starting to grow a yeah. little bit, and, and they're 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 missing key cogs that I think are kind of affecting them just a little bit. I'm not so much worried about Geelong. You got to be happy. You got to be happy for the Dockers purely because they're starting to find their mojo and and having that cauldron that is Optus Stadium out west, where it's very difficult to beat them out there gives them that extra little advantage. So they're going to be a team I'm going to keep an eye on, especially now that they're starting to find some great form. We jump up to the Q clash, which normally I hope is a little bit more competitive, but this one, the Brisbane Lions, just too good. 43 point win, 107, 64. Absolutely fantastic as the Brisbane Lions, I mean, pardon the pun here, are starting to roar. Yeah, and and uh, oh, it's it's not the Q clash; it's the pineapple grapple. Uh, <laughs> but um, I mean, I mean, they're 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 a team of good players, and they they really are. And, and there's a reason that they're 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 knocking 
right right behind the magpies i mean Denneher did his thing he with four cameron and hipwood and mccarthy uh, they all did really well and then you had ashcroft and mccluggage who getting the ball a lot and uh you know Lockie neal as well you know, gold coast is is again you know every time i feel like i come on here and talk to them it's it, it's it's one of these decent talent but never the results and yeah, I was hoping for this to be a little bit closer, but I mean, the Lions are all are are the much better team of the two, and um, you know they're they're in the thick of they're they're right in the thick of it. And goal and Gold Coast, it's 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 funny we talk you know I say this about how they're kind of you know like that they're only four points out of a final spot. So I mean, uh, this would have been a huge win for them. And and just taking a quick look at. Uh, and next week, uh, they are they're hosting the Bulldogs, uh, which could be which could be very difficult, especially with the Bulldogs coming off of that you know that that uh, victory, so uh, against Adelaide. So we'll see what happens. But I mean, the Lions really just showing their class. Yeah, just always so good. Charlie Cameron is so much fun seeing it in in in, in Indigenous round, even even better. So we jump to the MCG dream time of the MCG. Always a fascinating and absolutely magnificent showing, and the Bombers, the Bombers get a one point win over the Tigers, seventy one seventy, an absolutely scintillating game of footy. I have to say, this was a fantastic watch. The Dons get the win. And the Tigers again fall a little bit short. Their in their injuries costing them a little bit and, and a little bit of lack of execution. And some interesting news that happens not too long after. We will discuss that just in a little bit. But thoughts on this because this was a fantastic dream time game. It's best of the best of the round, probably the best of the one of the best of the season. Um, and this is the sort of thing that if you if you have somebody who's never watched footy before and you want to you know this is the sort of game that you want i mean a crowd of seventy eight thousand plus at the at the g it's a dream time game you know with the with all the all the 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 pomp and the importance around that and then you know you have uh and then you have this absolute classic and and what's interesting is is just how well Essendon played in the last 10 minutes with Menzi kicking the goal and then Durham winning the game with roughly about a minute and a half left. It's, um, it's, it's, it's an, it, you know, it, and it's amazing. As, and like you said, we'll, we'll talk about the implications that those have, but, but how about Essendon? I mean, again, this is a team that is, that is going to need every single point it gets in the standings if they if they want to play in the in, in in the finals and and for them to pick up this win it's going to be a huge boost for them and then um, next week they head out west to play the Eagles a team that's licking its wounds and we'll talk about that in a moment so they are they're the ones that are flying into this Richmond I mean listen Richmond didn't play a bad game uh, Richmond Richmond played well I mean again it was it was really really uh, tough. I mean, the biggest lead in the game was um, the biggest lead in the game. It looked like it was eighteen. They had an eighteen point lead at one point, but I just, I mean, as as well as they as well as they played, as well as they fight behind, you know, guys like Taranto and and Bolton, you know, Essendon, I think is definitely a more finals ready team, even you know at this point in the season. Yeah, definitely for sure. And it's just it's going to be fascinating to see how this goes, and especially with the the news that just came down a little bit. Again, we will discuss that in a little bit. We jump to the next game, and kind of the great little preview, licking the wounds. I, I'm going to make this simple. I'm not going to do a lot of hyperbole. Hawks absolutely embarrass the Eagles as the Eagles' troubles just continue as a 142 to 26, a 116 point win by the Hawks puts the Eagles troubles on the national map as everybody is talking about this game. I'm I'm not going to waste a lot of words on this. Hawks too good. Eagles are absolutely atrocious. Again, they, it, this is a waffle side. There, there's just no other way to say it. This is a waffle side playing in the AFL because of all of the injuries that have happened. Yes, you've got guys like Gaff. Yes, you've got guys like Oscar Allen. But for the most part, this is a waffle side playing in the AFL right now. 
I mean, it really is. I mean, and and I mean, they are they are the walking wounded, <laughs> and and it's it, it's got to be frustrating because and on one hand, these are guys who are getting the opportunity. It is really very much a baptism by fire. Although at this point it might be a baptism by napalm because that's basically what they have to face <laughs> week in and week out. Especially again, this is the the second largest. Um, this is the second largest win in uh, by a eight by a by a last place team, and you have to go all the way back to 1979. And I think it ended up it was like 178 points. And I want to say it was Collingwood. And I'm just as I'm as, as we're looking at this right now, I'm actually trying to like to, 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 to <laughs> trying to I'm, find it. I'm trying to find that, and also kind of see like. Uh, like what the war like like where this is on like the largest part i mean there have been some really 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 heavy defeats and you know you know games that have been decided by almost 200 points um but but the fact of the matter is is that i mean the, you're right it, it's a it's an afl side again not a great afl side playing uh playing a state league side and and the hawks did what they were supposed to do they went in and they and they did that and and just looking just to give you an idea the the Eagles scored scored all four of their goals in the first in the first half. Mm-hmm. Uh, they didn't score from the twenty seven fifty six mark of the second quarter. That was when Dom Sheed kicked kicked what ended up being the last major score of the game. And so you're looking at uh, sixty two, roughly sixty seven minutes of play without a major score. I mean, it, it it's it, it's it's it it is what it is, and mm-hmm. and you know. So they they again limp into a they're gonna they're gonna play an Essendon team that's coming off a huge win, and uh, you know and and Hawthorne is Hawthorne's Hawthorne. I mean they're gonna take this and try and run with it the rest of the season. Unbelievably, even with that large win, the Hawks are still in last place. Um, oh no, they're not. I'm sorry, they've climbed out now. I was looking at the wrong week. Whoops. Uh, they have now moved into 16th uh, alongside North Melbourne. Um, what this is going to do for them, I think it's a moral victory. Uh, you know, they they go and they take on St. Kilda next week, which is going to be tough. But I mean, you're right. I mean, there's not much to say about it, even though I just rambled for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the other statistic I heard somewhere, I think it was true, they had one mark inside 50 for the entire game. Mm-hmm. That that is that is mental in an AFL game that you can only have one inside fifty mark. That that's I just I literally couldn't believe it as I heard that statistic. I even had to look it up, and just could not believe it. Again, like I said, they've just been decimated with injuries. I, the people that are calling for Simpson to be fired, I just don't understand it because he, you can't really gauge him because he's trying to take guys that probably should not be on an AFL list or on an AFL side right now. And play them in AFL games because he's that dinged up. I mean, he's got he's got so many guys out that are going to be long term injuries for most of the season. This is just going to be one of those they're just going to have to battle through. And, and I worry that he that that Simpson. My worry for him is he gets fired, and it really this is nothing that he could have done. There's right. literally nothing unless he finds some dark magic and is able to somehow make every other team have the same problem that he has to, to even up the competition. And, and even that may be a little bit too little too late. Right. So, so before you move on, I, I just sure. want to put a bow on this and tell you that the, the, the long, the, the largest di- margin of victory by a last place team. I said it was Collingwood. It was Collingwood over St. Kilda. The caveat to this is this was round four. And so Collingwood was one and two at the time, but based on percentage, they were the last. Uh, they were in last place. The final score, and this is April 28th, 1979, Collingwood 31 21 207, St. Kilda 311 29, Collingwood winning by 178 points. Um, that record was not anywhere near in danger, but that kind of gives you uh, uh, mm-hmm. a, an idea. And by the way, uh, again, the other caveat to that is uh, Collingwood went to the grand final that ended up going to the grand final that year. So <laughs> don't feel too bad for them. A little bit, a little bit different when it comes to a situation there, but all right. So we, we won't put any more hurt on West coast. And again, Hawthorne get the win. Great for them. We move on to the old rivalry, Carlton V Collingwood. 
and I don't know about you, sir, but this one disappointed me a little bit because I was expecting Carlton to have some fight. I was expecting Carlton <laughs> to give the Pies a little bit of a run. Mackay and Kerno, the big two defenders, and this was Collingwood and really Collingwood most of the time. Huge tip of my cap to Darcy Moore tying the record. I guess in the last day, they've actually taken one of his intercept marks away. Mm -hmm. So he's, he ties it with 10, which kind of stinks, but it happens. But Collingwood win by 28, 85, 57. But this really was a game where I was more disappointed in Carlton's lack of effort than I was of calling uh, of anything of Collingwood. I knew Collingwood was going to win this game for sure, but it was Carl Carlton just seemed to have no fight or, or no answer to be able to put up a fight against Collingwood. Yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, for a team where, you know, everybody's kind of getting behind them as sort of this like plucky underdog that all of a sudden is kind of punching above its weight. Yeah. This is a little bit of a disappointment for them. It was really, uh, I think a, a you know, a good litmus test of where they are as a team and where they are as a club. And yeah, I, some of their bigger players didn't show up and, you know, I mean, it, it, it you know, I think the only one that did, I mean, Kerno, I mean, we, you know, we talk about him, he still took three goals. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and, and they too had issues with, with uh, accuracy kicking, kicking seven fifteen for the afternoon, but, but Collingwood, I mean, Collingwood just is, is rolling along Um uh, you know, you could say Dacos had 27 disposals and you'd be like Josh, uh, Josh or Nick. And the answer would be yes, because mm -hmm. they both had 27. Um, you know, Degoy had a good, as you mentioned, Darcy Moore with, uh, you know, 10 intercept, intercept marks. Um, and then un unfortunately, he won't have the record to himself. But still, I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at. And I'm sure he'll probably tell you, you know, the team won pretty well. And, you know, how about Mason Cox kicking another goal in mm -hmm. uh, what is game number 99 for him? Um, you know, and listen, you're talking to you, you got two Americans here. We've we've met him. <laughs> we've both met him. Mm -hmm. um, met him and know. actually legitimately met him at nationals this year. He shook my hand and my hand disappeared. <laughs> so uh, my, uh, my, you probably my wouldn't dad, remember me, but it was kind of funny. Well, well, it's fine. I mean, and I, and I know him and I know, you know, obviously through, through what I do and uh, you know, just, just the nicest guy. The funny thing is, is I interviewed him, I want to say about three, four years ago. And my dad looked at the interview and he goes, cause and listen, I mean, for those of you who have never stood next to me, I'm about six feet tall. And my dad said, looked at this interview and said, you look like a jockey next to him. <laughs> um, of course, of course, we've now seen that picture of, um, of him with Razor Ray on his shoulders and, uh, mm -hmm. it does very much like they're heading towards the, uh, the fifth at Santa Anita, but, um, Ed, uh, yeah, yeah, but he, he played well, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you on this one. I think this, I, this was a little bit disappointing in the end and, you know, um, you know, Coll Collingwood's still at the top and as, and, you know, as for, as for Carlton, uh, you know, just just kind of looking and seeing, you know, where where they're where where they are right now. I mean, they're they're two points out of out of a final spot, and they kick things off uh, against your your Bloods at the SCG uh, mm -hmm. on Friday. I think that if if they're going to do what they need to, I mean, they need to win that. I mean, considering mm -hmm. that Sydney Sydney's in a very similar situation. Sydney's a game back. Um, you know, they need to win. I, I think it's going to be a very, I think it's going to be a war. And uh, I think you're going to find a lot, a lot about Carlton in, uh, in, in that match. Yeah, I agree. I, I, in fact, I actually just sat down with Blue Abroad just before this podcast and we, we discussed that. And I said, I said, it's the battle of two pessimistic fan bases because both fan bases are not exactly going into the game with a ton of confidence. But yeah. we'll discuss that a little bit later. We'll go last game of the round. She's GWS. Stay in this one. Uh, pesky side. And I almost kind of go... GWS is one of those teams that they're tough, that they stay in games. They probably shouldn't because they're just that pesky against the St. Kilda team that I think, I think they're St. Kilda is coming back to the group a little bit. They had that great start to the season. I think they're kind of coming back to the mean a little bit, only a 12 point win over GWS. The saints get a win, but if I, if I'm Ross Lyon, I'm a little worried that maybe the magic that you had early in the season is starting to wear off a little bit. I feel like they have, um, you know, they're almost like have a rabbit's foot because they, 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 they've, they've end up breathing a sigh of relief. It's like, we're really not going to, we're not going to lose this game, are we? You know, and, and mm -hmm. it's the same way I felt with GW with this game against GWS. 
And, and and let's face it, I mean GWS does have does have a share of decent players, and Lockie Whitfield leading the way with thirty two touches, and you know, um, but but you know the 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 Saints are good enough of a team to where I you know they've they've earned where they currently are in in the ladder, which right now they're sitting in fifth on percentage in that tie with Melbourne and and the Bulldogs, but. You know, I, I want to see more out of them. I think, like you said, they are coming back to the pack right now. Um, and and who do they have? Well, they host, they host Hawthorne next week, uh, which should be very intriguing considering. I mean, you would think on paper that that they would win that game. But, I mean, <laughs> in there it's it's sort of almost like like a heart attack almost the way that mm-hmm. the way that they've been but but we'll see i mean they've definitely earned where they've been but i think where they're going to be now i think is you know the next couple of games as we said they have hawthorne next and then uh after that uh their next game i think they have the buy and ra- it looks like in round 12 and then they get sydney at the sag uh on the on in round 13 so I mean, the next couple of games is really i think going to determine i think they're both winnable games and it's not a matter of just just if they win, but how they win and how they play that will determine really how they go the rest of the way and where they end up in the ladder. Yeah, I, I agree. It'll be fascinating to keep an eye on St. Kilda, definitely, for sure. So that will do it for the nine games from round 10. Let's jump to it, sir. The burning questions. I've got a few, and then we have to talk the major news and our headline section. But let's start with the burning questions. We kind of discussed this a little bit during our round reviews. There is an eight-point gap between sixth and seventh on the ladder. So I asked this, are we at the point where the top six really right now are the only teams that are still in contention to win a premiership? No, Um, and that's because... I've, you know, it's interesting to think about this and I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cross sports streams a little bit, sure. you know, uh, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm a Phillies fan. Um, the Phillies had the worst record of all of the 12 uh, teams that played in the major league baseball playoffs last year. They made it to the world series. Now, mind you, the playoff format and the games and the dynamics a little bit different, but all you have to do is get to the point and it, it, all you have to do is play four really good games. And it's, you know, it's obviously much tougher to do this in the, under the scrutiny of the finals, but you never really can. Now are the chances a lot, uh, not as, not as great as some of the teams at the top. Probably. I mean, I'm looking at some of these teams that are right now sitting at 20 points, you know, Geelong, Adelaide, Essendon, Fremantle, I think Essendon, honestly, I would say is probably playing the most consistently uh, of of the of the teams right now of those four teams. Um, you know, Geelong started out terribly, got good, and they've kind of regressed a little bit. Adelaide, like you said, I think they got completely let off the hook in Ballarat. And then you've got, and then you've got Frio, uh, who you know they they're going to need to score more. Uh, if, if they want to have a chance and then you have Carlton. So, I mean, I would say of all those teams, I think if Essendon can, can keep their, uh, keep their foot on the pedal a little bit, I think they'll have the best chance, but I wouldn't write any of those teams off yet. And not only that, but, you know, like you said, St. Kilda's kind of coming back to the pack. It'll be interesting to see if they are still in the contention that they are in the top four. And some of these other teams, you know, I mean, I feel like the Bulldogs are going to get better. You know, Melbourne, we mentioned their injury issues as well. And, you know, uh, Port Adelaide is kind of, you know, is it has the knock here and there. But um, I wouldn't count any of those teams out completely at this juncture. Yeah, I wouldn't count them either, especially looking at it. And Geelong is one of those where it's like Geelong last year had had kind of a rocky start. And then they went on that magnificent run to end the year. They're still not 100% healthy. They get healthy. They're going to rise up the ladder. They're going to win a few games. So I I agree. I I don't think it is. It's a little bothersome that there is that eight-point gap between sixth and seventh because it does kind of make it to where you look at it and you go, well, the top six may be, Uh may be set. It's just the last two teams in. But I don't know. Again, the Western Bulldogs, St. Kilda, Melbourne, they're all at 28. 
a slip up here, a slip up there, and it, the whole thing tightens back up again. So I, this is, it's going to be an exciting season. I still think you just never know when an upset's going to happen. North Melbourne is a team that I'm going to keep an eye on because I think they could play spoiler to some of these final teams because they're going to nip somebody. As well as they played against Sydney, if they can get a decent thing and they can get LDU back and, and get some good service to Nick Larkey and some of those forwards, they're going to cause some issues. I think this thing is going to tighten up. I don't think there's going to be that eight-point gap between sixth and seventh as the season goes on. I think it will tighten up. So I will look forward to that coming. So we go from the top of the table now to the bottom. And I love these hypotheticals. They're always fun. Which of the bottom three teams next year do you think bounce up the ladder quicker? North, the West Coast, or Hawthorne? Well, I mean, West Coast has to pretty much figure out how to evacuate their team out of a hospital. So there's that. <laughs> um, Hawthorne, I think, is still kind of finding their way. And North is, I think, I think of the teams, and I say this as a Hawk supporter, I think North, mm-hmm. I think I'm with you. I think North shows probably the most promise. I like the way that they're, that they're doing it. It's a shame because I almost also feel, and, and you also kind of look at how, what things are going on right now. You've got the situation with Alice for Clarkson. Um, but I think they've got a good core, so we'll have to see how they go. I think, I think honestly, it's, it's kind of difficult because I think they, it's, it's a relatively low bar. I mean, Hawthorne has a decent, has, has a good side. They're an entertaining side, but, um, I think North is probably, probably the slightest, but they've got a lot of, a lot of stuff happening with, with the Clarkson situation as well, too. Yeah, I agree. I think with if you just look at the list and go young talent that will progress over the next five years, North is definitely heads and shoulders. I'm interested to see how the coaching of, of, of Mitchell will do at Hawthorne. I think that may change a few things. I think North and Hawthorne are very, very similar. I think West Coast, I don't think they've bottomed out yet, which is no. kind of disturbing to say i don't think they've bottomed out because they haven't gotten rid of a shuey and nick nat Nui and elliot yo some of the old some of the more mature players shall we say i hate saying older considering most of these guys i'm actually older than it's really weird to say the mature agers on this list to maybe start to kind of maybe get some draft capital and maybe try to work on youth on in this list right now they just don't have that so I would say North, but I think Hawthorne isn't too far off of it a little bit, but I think North jumps up a little bit quicker. So we said we would discuss it. I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but I'm going to ask this. North's error gives Sydney the win. Was the punishment too harsh or was it just the situation where the results was because of where the game was when it happened? It, it's the perfect storm. It's, it's the, uh, it is where the ball happened to be. Um, again, it's one of those situations where, you know, it, 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 it just happened to be where the ball was. Um, you know, there was nothing, nothing. I mean, the only, the only, the only way that that, that that happens is if they don't make that extra sub, if they don't make that extra interchange, it's harsh. It perhaps is a little unfair, but there's honestly, you know, there's a reason that particular rule is in place in spite of all the the cries from all the traditionalists saying, you know, that that it's just another way to muck up the game and another way to create something like that. But honestly, like the the the, the officiating crew handle that in the correct fashion. Um, you know, it's it's frustrating. It's frustrating to see. I mean, again, baseball fan, pitch clocks. You know that sort of thing, but it's uh, it's all of that is in place to make sure that the game runs smoothly. And and you know it, it's I mean it's it's, unfor- it's highly unfortunate that all of that happened with the ball where it was in the field. Again, if it's 180 meters in the other direction, maybe we're not talking about that because you know now they get a free kick from the middle of the ground. Now there's a chance for them to set up, but unfortunately that was the way it happened and. Uh, it, it, the rules work the way they were supposed to be. And I know that North, no, no consolation to, to North or their fans, especially in this very difficult week, but it is what it is. Uh, it's always interesting. Again, I was one of those. It's like, 
I didn't want to go online and go into it because you you had some that were very some North fans were very very emotional. This is this is a travesty. This is a robbery. I'm like, well, technically it really isn't. The rule is there. They follow the rule by the law. You can't really argue it. Does it stink because it does change the end of the game? Yes, but I mean you can't really fight it. It's there. It's a black and white rule. This isn't one of those subjective, like holding the ball situations where yeah. there's gray area. I mean, this is really one of those you do 76, you pay for it the first time, a opportunity for the free kick to be paid. It's it's the way it goes. They they violated they violated the rule. You're no, you're absolutely right. There's no subjectivity to this. Mm-hmm. It is clearly there. It was, you know, to keep track of it, it is it is clearly there. If it was one of those judgment calls, then you could probably, you know, that and if it's a bang bang call, and we see a lot of those, mm-hmm. um, you know, we've seen deliberates that haven't that 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 were weren't really deliberate that we've been given that that we've seen and they've led to directly to a goal, Collingwood. Uh, you know, we've seen all these other, all these other rules that are at the discretion of the referee. This was an outright violation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I, I say referee in general and not, you know, in this case, obviously umpire, but <laughs> yelling, yelling at soccer officials too much, but, um, <laughs> but, but that's the thing. I mean, I mean, they can't have any complaints. They, they really, really can't. Everything was executed in the prescribed manner. So. Yeah, it, it, I mean, like I said, it's, it's very black and white. I hate doing it that way. And again, I have many, many a North fan and I've discussed with them and I, and I said, th- there's not much you can do. You can't really complain about the rule. The, the part that stinks was the the people at the ground didn't know what was going on. It's the one thing I almost wish there was a way to have the umpires mic'd to where when they call it, the fans can hear it. I think that's the part that was the most frustrating, especially after finding out there were some fans that had thrown some things onto the the field, which I understand your frustration, but I I look at that and I go, come on and grow up. I mean, what if you hit a little kid throwing a pop bottle? Come on. So I I don't want, I don't want to be the mother hen situation here, but that's just, that's the thing that really irks me off about the whole situation. I understand you're frustrated. It sucks to lose that way, but you can't do that. That is dangerous for more than more than a few people with people chucking whatever onto the field. So I've got a three-year-old, so I can assure you, you're not being a Karen in this situation. (laughs) All righty. And we jump to it. My favorite question. I love during the Sir Douglas Nichols rounds, the Guernseys, I absolutely adore them. They are fantastic. If there was any way I could get all of them and be able to display them on my wall, I would love to it. So I asked this, what is your favorite Guernsey so far of the Sir Douglas Nichols rounds? Ooh, um, it's kind of hard to go past uh, Fremantles just because I love what they what they do and how they incorporate the design uh, in their in theirs every year. Um those of you who are looking in, it's funny. Uh, both both Donnie and I have the same swans uh, one with the giant black swan, uh, which is which is interesting, and I like that one a lot. Um, uh, it's it, it's interesting because every year it, it always amazes me the they're so pretty. Like I want them, and I mean this in a in a in a in a sincere way. I mean the 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 amount of effort it's like you almost want to see them where i i will say i like <clears throat> i'm appreciative of the fact that uh melbourne uh i think because there was a there was a mix up last year they actually have two versions they actually have a regular version and a clash of theirs which i think is really which is really good i love um i love the subtle dig to uh the port putting the magpie on their jumper <laughs> um, I think that's, that's absolutely, that that's absolutely fantastic. And how about St. Kilda with bringing yellow back? Um, and for those of you, I'm sure if you're from Australia, especially if you're a St. Kilda fan, you know, but for those of you who might not be familiar, um, St. Kilda for many, you know, from the beginning and since probably the 1920s have been red, white, and black. During World War One, they added yellow and took out the white because those were the red, white, and black at the time was the flag of Germany. Um, of course, what did Germany do in the 1930s? They added yellow to their flag. Uh, 
<laughs> and then they went <laughs> and then they went to war with the world again. Um, but it was great to so it was great to see them bring it back. And obviously there was a so I really like them. I like free mantles. I mean, I just like what they do with their with their color scheme every year and uh incorporate their design into into what they have. So that would be my pick. I'm interested to see uh, which one which one you like. Well, I, I'm one of those, as you kind of said, is I have the Black Swan one, and I thought it was funny that the year that I got that was the year that Sydney finally decided to change theirs to the one that they wore last year, and then again, again this year with the, with the with the blue with the blue markers being all of the indigenous players that have that have played for the Swans, which I thought was really really cool. I agree with you. I think y- Yalta Puti or Port Adelaide's is fantastic. I I love the color scheme, and I love St Kilda's because maybe for me i see it as is it's honoring the indigenous the the um the indigenous flag because you have yeah. the red black and the yellow so i thought that was a really really cool touch there i agree with you Fremantle's is absolutely outstanding there, there isn't one that i dislike i think they're all great i i do like that nam decided to do the, the clash jumpers to be able to cover that which i thought was really really cool Again, again, I could look at each one of these and absolutely love them. I, the indigenous art is absolutely magnificent. It is great, but Saint Kilda's is my favorite just because I think the 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 look of the the, the indigenous flag is fantastic. I thought that they looked absolutely fan. Uh, they looked magnificent on. Um, so I would say Saint Kilda. I'm like I said. I I prefer the. I think the black swan was always my favorite for Sydney. I, do I I I like the blue the 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 one that they have with the blue in it this year but it, it's i still like the blacks one a little bit so per, personal preference yeah yeah it, it's it is very much so and it, and you know what like i and maybe it's because i i i'm not as close to the those particular communities um but it's interesting to me to like learn and read about it and the history and what the symbolism of everything is and um, it's, it is very educational. It's educational for, you know, because, and I was talking about this with a, with a friend of mine, um, how about, about how they love the, the, not, again, it's not just about the jumpers. It's about all the ceremony and the stuff and, and that happens. Um, and we would never see something like that here in the U S and I think there was an exception, which is, I think in, in Vancouver and in, in the NHL, they had a, an indigenous, uh, like a warm-up jersey or something along those lines, and they had uh, as well. Um, and I and and forgive me for forgetting the details, but um, it would be great if they had this. And I'm, unfortunately, I don't I don't see any league uh, doing anything like this. I think the only exception, the only exception that I think that I can definitely think of in American sports, and it's a permanent thing, was there was a minor league baseball team out west called the Spokane Indians. And they have, um, and, you know, there's a, there's obviously, if you've been following world sport, you know, that there's uh, been controversy over certain nicknames with native American references and whatnot. Mm -hmm. The Spokane Indians do, uh, they still have their name because they actually did reach out. uh, The team did to the Spokane, uh, to the Spokane tribe uh, and, they came up with their uh, uniforms and their logos uh, with their input. And uh, if you want to go and check it out online and see how well they've done with it. And I think if you look at, uh, I think Chris Kramer uh, and there might be somebody else did a really great piece about, about how they incorporated uh, they sell, they do occasionally wear jerseys where Spokane is written out in, in that particular language. Uh, they have hats with that as well. Um, and they, they work with them, I think, in terms of just, uh, you know, they, they get uh, money in terms of, and they get, they get some of the, some of the, uh, the proceeds of, of that. So it's not like they're stealing their identity and stealing anything else. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I don't know that we would ever see anything like that here for, for various reasons that I shan't get into, but it is great to see a sport embrace the community in the way that it has and give, again, those of us who, who, aren't Australian and don't have that particular heritage to learn and to educate ourselves and to, you know, especially what with all the, with, with a lot of the stuff and uh, that's happening in, in the news. And of course, you're probably reading about the, the thing with the voice in parliament. 
um, it's very pivotal that this happened. So I, mm-hmm. I know I was a little long winded, but, but um, my point. No, I completely agree with that. It's one of those, and I've said it to many of the Australians that I chat with. I said this round is fantastic because it does. You're able to still connect with the with the Aboriginal culture, and, and you get to hear these great stories. And many, many a time, some of the Aboriginal players are the ones that design these jerseys, which is even cooler that they have this artistic and that they have this artistic flair. Like personally, I was able to chat with Alicia Newman, and I love keeping track of her because she paints boots for several of her teammates and even some of her opponents and for her to be able to express her culture that way is absolutely fantastic i i it is absolutely magnificent my only i think the only one that i am aware of that's here in the states is the Flor- florida state university when it comes to the seminole tribe because i believe they have an agreement with the seminole tribe that many of the historic some of the elders of the tribe actually teach seminal history at the university as well. So it's one of the few things that they've kind of avoided that as well, because the, the university has always kind of embraced the Seminole tribe and the tribe has embraced the university using the the name. So it, it's never really been an issue, at least for Florida state, where you see like maybe even like Illinois in, in the local area, they're the Illini, but they technically can't have, they don't have anything with any kind of native um, pictures or anything like that in their, in their, um, in their um, logo. Right. So not all of them have embraced it as much, but it is cool to see when, when indigenous peoples are recognized in a positive light and not in, in any way negative. So that's why I absolutely love this round as well. So not to throw in some American stuff there. I know it. So we will jump to it. The big headline, the thing that has broken less than 36 hours ago, it's one of the reasons why recording this a little bit later isn't a bad thing because we've kind of let the typhoon of, of information come out and go. So here it is. Richmond's Demi Hardwick has resigned as of this morning and effective immediately. He is no longer the coach at the Richmond footy club. As difficult as this was to see Demi go, I completely understand it, but this is, this, this is a typhoon in the coaching world, because not only does it now leave a big job open where this huge club, the Richmond Tigers, and, and I would still say an attractive job for any coach, but it's now throws some interesting little shade at Port Adelaide because now does Port Adelaide change their mind on negotiations and try to get Kenny Hinckley signed before August? Yeah. Like you said, it really kind of touches off a, uh, a, uh, really kind of a domino effect of now what what are the different what do the teams do and and what do they do over the course of uh over the over the course of uh you know of, of the next couple of months i think in just kind of taking a step back and looking at you know why now you know when you think about the fact that he's in his what is this his 14th year of coaching the tigers and you think about I remember, you know, before 2017 and you heard that, you know, Tigers fans were ready to give up on the club and give up on their memberships and and whatnot. And you think about an era where, I mean, and I'm, and I'm trying to kind of give you, give you kind of a basic idea. Um, You know, I mean, the last year, you know, last year they, they had, again, they've been kind of going back and forth 13 and eight, 13, eight and one last year. 9 12 and 1 the year before and then and then those other seasons where they had you know again three out of four years i you know it, it's the most successful run they've had as a as a club since uh since the 1970s you know i mean that's that is the last time that they that that the tigers have been relevant in in, in such a in in such a a, a uh uh that particular period of time uh you know again in 2016 when they had gone from from making the finals three years in a row and they finished in 13th they were ready again a lot of people were ready to give up i think doing it now is as good of a move as possible because the chances of them, unless they go on a tear, I mean, they've only got, I mean, they've got the 14 points and they're only six points out of a final spot. So they're not, you know, they're not out of completely out of the wood, out, out of, out of contention. 
but it's clear that he doesn't want to coach there next year. Step aside, bring in guys who are going to get the experience, let the players get adjusted to the fact that they're going to, you know, if, if they're able to make the finals from this, obviously it would be a huge deal and would, you know, be a, be a bit of a surprise. But if not, then you've got them. They have all of these players that are coming up for the system. And it also gives the Tigers, in addition to the end of the season, it's still May. They have, you know, six months, seven months, basically, to look around, see who they want as their next coach. So I think it's a great move in so far as, you know, obviously he wants to move on. It probably shocked a lot of people considering how well he had done. I mean, and again, from 2013 up until last season, they only missed the finals twice. And so, you know, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what happens with that, with the Hinkley situation. But I mean, when you, when you look back and you consider like how much he's done, I don't know that a coach has done that much uh, with a particular club over that amount of time in recent history. Yeah, I can't disagree with you again. As as much as I've given him crap for the sucking that he's done after a few of those after a few losses there, and especially the whole comment about Marvel Stadium, he was he was not exactly on my Christmas card list. But again, I respect Demma Hardwick. He was an incredible coach. What he did at Richmond, you cannot deny. Three out of four years, he probably should have won that fourth, except for the man, the myth, the legend that is Mason Cox. Really, so. Again, my my hat tip to him as a coach. I, I hope I hope that this doesn't see the end of Dima Hardwick in coaching. If it is, as sad as it is, I'm happy for him. If he does find himself, I just want him to be happy and healthy when it comes to his coaching because you never like to see a guy with that much talent and that much ability as a coach walk out and never see it again. So, And, and it's funny because um, I just happen to be looking at, at uh, Twitter at the moment and uh, – our, our mutual friend, Marnie Vinyl, uh, retweeted uh, a picture of uh, Dima <laughs> heading out from <laughs> heading into work. Uh, it would have been uh, yesterday or the day before with this big grin on his face. Uh, it's because you, you just as you had mentioned, like how happy he was. And yeah, no, I hope I, I'm, I'm sure this isn't the end for coaching and him. I'm sure he'll pop up somewhere and um yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I, it'll be interesting to see what the next chapter is and what kind of uh, waves this makes. Yeah, definitely for sure. Uh, so we would we jump from that to the headlines is fantastic. It is. We'll jump to a little bit of Coach Hess's takeover of the podcast a little bit with my team of the week and power rankings. I know sometimes it's always fun, especially when I'm trying to introduce this. Now, Brian has been through this, so he kind of knows. I've refined it a little bit this year. I've actually started to kind of make it a little more positional based to try to give a little bit more of just five running halfbacks who occasionally can kick a goal in the back line. So I've been trying to separate it out. I've added wings this year. So this year I'm trying to give some love to the wing position. So here is round 10's team of the week, starting with the full back line, Hawthorne's James Sicily, Collingwood's Darcy Moore, and St. Kilda's Callum Wilkie, all with a lot of intercept defending, both playing all three playing great defensive games with some big time intercept marks, helping their teams out playing great defense on the halfback line. We have Port Adelaide's Dan Houston, Hawthorne's Josh Weddle, who went bonkers for his first game and got him a uh, rising star nomination and St. Kilda's Jack Sinclair round out the halfback line in the ruck. Todd Goldstein. I watched him dominate a young rookie, a young rookie, and he did incredible getting around the ground on the wings. We have Norse um, Harry Sheasel and Essendon's Sam Durham. You kept kick a game winner hard not to get you in the team of the week in the square sees Norse Jai Simpkin, Richmond's Shy Bolton and West Coast Dom Sheed. Yes, the West Coast player gets in when you kick two goals out of the midfield, even for a team that only kicks four goals. You got to get a little bit of the tip of the cap from the old ball coach. At the half forward line, we see Sydney's Lance, Buddy Franklin, St. Kilda's Max King, and Carlton's Charlie Kerno. And then the full forward line, Brisbane's Joe Danaher, Hawthorne's Mitch Lewis, and last but not least, Collingwood's 
Brody Mayacek rounds out our starters. Going to the bench, we have defenders, Fremantle's James Aish, Ruckman from GWS, Kieran Briggs, midfielder from the Western Bulldogs, Jack McRae, and last but not least, forward from Hawthorne, Luke Bruce. That rounds out my team of the week again. Hawthorne, Hawthorne and North getting a little more love from the old ball coach a little bit, having some great games. So got to be a little bit nice, even to some teams that haven't had the greatest seasons, but some players with some magnificent showing. So real quick, Brian, thoughts on the team of the week this week? Sounds good. <laughs> I love it. Short, sweet, fantastic. We'll jump to the power rankings. And again, I say it every week. I go off form. I don't go off where they are on the ladder. So here is how I see it. At number five, the Melbourne Demons. Yes, they lost, but still a strong team. Keeping up at the top. They have had one. They have won four out of the last five. The Western Bulldogs at number four. Number three, the Collingwood Magpies. Number two, the Port Adelaide Power. And number one, the Brisbane Lions are my number one team in my power rankings again. A lot of these teams at the top have won four and five in a row, so it's hard not to have them there by form. Melbourne stays in that fifth spot just because they have been high on the power rankings the previous couple of weeks, and you lose, but they've still played really, really good footy. So that's going to do it for the power rankings there. We jump to it. My favorite part of the podcast, always so much fun, the tips. So let's jump into it. We are just a little over a day and a half away from the first bounce of the first game. And it's a doozy and an interesting one at that. And I just had a podcast with Blue Abroad. So I'm I'm fascinated to see how Brian sees this. Sydney Swans, Carlton Blues, SCG. Who do you like? Um, On form, I like the Swans. They're playing at home. Um, You know, Carlton needs to actually like not lay an egg in this game if they want to have any <laughs> chance but i i think it's going to be tough to do so at the scg i picked the swans and, and see for me my worry is that back line has so many injuries and my worry for, i know i'm a diehard swans fan i really wanted to tip the swans but i think carlton what they have if they can get it going and get it and in, in, in show the way they have been playing i think what they have up forward is dangerous to what Sydney doesn't have in defense. I'm going to tip Carlton, but I think this comes down to the fourth quarter. I think it is less than 10 points. I think this is an absolute cracker. It may not be the most scintillating footy. It may not be the most champagne footy, but it'll be a heck of a game of football. We jump down to Marvel Stadium, St. Kilda v. Hawthorne. I have the Saints. As much as the Hawks win was impressive, I just think the Saints abilities are just going to be a little bit too much for still a young Hawks team. (laughs) I'm going, I'm going Hawks in this one. And I'll tell you why I think St. Kilda, I think, you know, I don't think they, you know, they, they played well last week, uh, you know, against the plucky team. They got beat by Adelaide a couple, like pretty big, a couple of weeks ago, a team that's below them on the ladder uh, you know, they, they played, uh, they, they beat North Melbourne and honestly, uh, I don't think they were, I mean, they won by 30 points. They didn't look all that great, um, uh, you know, against them. So I think based on form, I think this is, I I'm going to say that Hawthorne comes out. It's going to be a low scoring game. If, if that's the case, it's either St. Kilda is going to win by a blowout or Hawthorne is going to win a low scoring game. But if you're asking me for a tip, I'm, I'm going with the Hawks in an upset. All right, interesting. First upset call. Here we go. Melbourne Cricket Ground Fremantle flies across back over to Victoria to take on Melbourne. Who do you like in this one? Uh, I like Narm. Narm uh, in this one. I think the. I think again, they're starting to come to come in with all the injuries and whatnot. But um, uh, I don't know. You know, with the way that Fremantle, as we said, how their offense has been, I think this is going to be tight. But I do like Melbourne in Melbourne uh, against against the Doc Show. Yeah, I got the D's as well. I think just too strong again. For some weird reason, Fremantle leaves Western Australia and a little bit of their powers go away from them a little bit. I think I think Nam's going to be a little bit turbed after a, a lackluster performance in the previous in the previous round. So I, I like I like Nam in this one. Down to GMHBA Stadium as Geelong hosts the Giants. 
The Cats may be injury proof, but I just think they've got just a little too much talent. I think Jeremy Cameron goes bunta against his old team, maybe kicks five or six. I have the Cats in this one. I think the Cats big. Hard, hard to go against. Hard to go <laughs> against the the uh, the Cats at Goomba Stadium. Um, <laughs> I uh, I think I think the Cats as well. I don't think it's going to be that big of a blowout, especially after the way that uh, that GWS hung with the Saints last week. I I think Geelong will win, but I think we're talking maybe like four or five goals. I think. Yeah, up up a little bit. Northern Queensland at To Stadium as Gold Coast hosts the Doggies. As much as I want to tip the Suns in this one, usually going up a little bit further north, I think gives Queensland a little bit more of an advantage. I just think the Duggies are just a little bit more consistent. The biggest question I have is can Jared Witts get the majority of the ruck tap outs to his midfield? No Tuke Miller. It's going to be a little bit difficult. I think the Doggies win this one. I think the Suns are close. I think this is my watch out for an upset. I don't call it but I could see the Suns maybe getting a nip, a, a, a plucky win here over the doggies, but I'll tip the doggies in this one. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I think if there's, I think, I mean, I think Hawthorne's kind of my big upset of the week, but I think if, if they weren't, I would say that that Gold Coast would be now I'm, I'm with you. I, I tip the Bulldogs, but a Saints, a Suns win at home at, uh, at uh, probably, uh, is is wouldn't be a, a huge huge shock mm-hmm. so i i pick, right. i picked the doggies all right out west i'm not even going to waste the time on this one i think Essendon beats west coast out west and west coast is just again until they until they get some of their injuries back this is the easiest tip every single round i think Essendon gets themselves a nice little percentage boost in this one am i jumping are you with me on Essendon on this one yeah, I um, you know, we just got a uh, we actually just got a call uh from Adam Simpson. Uh he wanted to know if the parents <laughs> who left behind the uh the 18 kids at uh, Opta Stadium last week could come and pick them up because they're beating the Eagles by five goals. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's hilarious all right back over to the mcg is richmond demolis take on kenny hinckley's port adelaide power who do you like in this one um ah this is this is this is the uh the the the, the hinckley bowl i guess uh in in, in <laughs> point of fact say. yeah um i like port um, but I th- also think that Richmond has something to prove. But I'm interested to see also what the what the crowd is going to be like. It's a Sunday afternoon game. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the Tigers generally, on, in some of these games, tend to draw a lot. Um, it's going to be difficult against an interstate team. But um, I like I like Port. But I think I think that the Tigers I think will have something to prove here, and I don't think they're going to be a pushover by any stretch of the imagination. It's it's the new it's the new coach bounce that I'll be interested to see. Can Kenny Hinckley and and Port kind of snuff out? Because if Richmond can stay in this or even take the lead at some point, then you're going to get the crowd into it, and then it could it could get ugly for Port if that happens. I think if Port can get a couple three four goal lead early in the first quarter, kind of swell that that little ground swell maybe of the new coach playing for the new coach because Dimmer's out. If they can do that, I think Port's too strong. Port's really playing well. I think Hinkley is going to feast on a team that I think is vulnerable. Richmond, I think, will be in this. I think Port just a little bit too good. But Richmond, I'm going to keep an eye on this one because this this screams upset to me potentially because of the, the new coach bounce back on the road at the G Port Adelaide sometimes doesn't always travel as well. So we'll have to see. We jump to Marvel stadium as Collingwood host the North Melbourne kangaroos. I think the ruse are plucky. They stay in until halftime and then Collingwood's talent and skill takes over pies and, and pies by uh, at least four goals. Collingwood in a route. Mason Cox kicks four in his 100th game. <laughs> and steel side bottom is 300th which is the only disappointing thing about that whole thing is that mason cox has his steel side bottoms 300th on the same round i i almost wish mason cox would get dropped just so then he can have his 100th next round all by himself but you can never get it perfectly on no that no one. no you don't you don't drop cox <laughs> for a game against one of the worst teams in the league you drop side bottom and <laughs> you drop side bottom because they could play with without side bottom and still be, be okay yep. 
Probably. All righty. And last but not least, a cracking game with the Adelaide Oval to end the round as the Adelaide Crows host the Brisbane Lions. Uh, this is my upset. I like the Crows in this one. The Crows at home coming off, I think, what Maddie Nix is going to lay into his team a little bit. I think Tex Walker comes back in. He always gives them a jump. Brisbane, when they leave the confines of the GABA, kind of regress a little bit, and the home crowd comes out. I think the Crows nip the Lions in this one and send shockwaves throughout the AFL. Lions by, we'll call it, nine. I think it's going to be a close game. I think, you know, Adelaide is in that. These teams sometimes, like, in the middle of the ladder. It's mm-hmm. almost like it's almost like they see the in a horse race. Which you know, with the Preakness last week, it's kind of you know, kind of kind of. But anyway, um, they see these teams that are kind of around them, and I think it helps them lift. But I think I think the Lions are way are in form. You're right; they don't always play well away from home. But I think just in form, I think that will kind of carry them through, especially with the way that some of their guys played last week. So I think it's the Lions, but I think it's less than two goals. Awesome, awesome. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to do it for the tips. And that's also going to do it for another fantastic podcast. Brian, I appreciate every time you come in. It's always great to talk with another footy head, especially an American one, because a little bit, a little bit selfishly, having at least a decent podcast time instead of 5 a.m. sometimes is a nice little positive little change for me. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 uh you know, I still listen, I still I still have an early bedtime. I don't know about you, but you know, it, it's uh it you know it is always good to talk, and it also uh, reminds it also uh keeps me honest because I have to go back and look and make sure that I'm paying attention to the games. Um, and if I may have five seconds of everybody's time. As Donnie mentioned, I work for the United States Australian Football League as their lead play-by-play commentator, and our season is underway. Check us out at usafl.com. We have a couple of tournaments coming up, which we hope will either be live-streamed or at the very least taped. Uh, We have a super regional happening in Kansas City on June 24th. Or the 23rd? It's that weekend. I think it's the 24th. July 15th, we'll be in Seattle, Washington for the Western Regionals. Uh, these are all local teams. Most of them are American. We have a, uh, a two-test series, the USA uh, against Canada. Uh, the men play on the 5th. The women play on the 19th of August. This is in Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, we're hoping to have that live streamed for you. And then, of course, we have the national championships in Bradenton, Sarasota, Florida in October 14th and 15th. If you enjoy good grassroots footy uh, and you want to hear uh, you know, what an American sounds like calling Aussie rules, uh, if, you, if, you, if you enjoy two Americans talking about Aussie rules and you want to see what that's all about, by all means. So thank you, Donnie, for, for indulging me on that. No problem. Again, as, as somebody who's absolutely fantastic, I've been to nationals. I've had the pleasure of calling games with Brian. I've had the pleasure of calling games with the fantastic Peter Holden, who is an Australian who tries to come over every year to call the women's games. It is fantastic. And I tell you to any Aussies that are watching this, if you can get over here for one of these tournaments, for centrals, for Western regionals, or for nationals, come over because it is a fantastic way to meet a bunch of Americans who love this sport. And we love talking it, especially guys like myself who will talk about it even on a podcast. So that is going to do it for our podcast today. Again, keep an eye out more coverage, Sandful, Waffle, BFL still coming and some great interviews coming up with state league and AFL and AFLW players coming up. Keep an eye on the channel and we will be back again very soon with another episode of Donnie's disposal. Here's the song.